Well, welcome back. Here we are at the second chapter of the book, What Happens at Mass. And today we're going to be talking about the introductory rites. And before we get into the introductory rites, um, we wanted to talk about music and the importance of music in the liturgy. And I think there's um, a lot of misconceptions about what music is at Mass. Sometimes people think about um, you know, singing at Mass, but actually the Church's intention is that we sing the Mass and that, ma that music is, is integral to, um, to our participation. And as, as uh, Father Jeremy Driscoll points out, that it's us singing together. And I know Deacon has a lot to say about, about music, but one of the things I just wanted to point out at first is one, sometimes we uh, people will ask, well, why do you sing a hymn and then sing a chant? And we sing this entrance chant um, as we come into um, the sanctuary. And so I'll let Deacon kind of talk about uh, the importance of music and you know, why we, we do what we do here at St. Charles. Well, singing, of course, is just a natural expression of the joy that we as humans have. I mean, you think about your work in the yard, your work doing things around the house, you have a family celebration and singing, not as much maybe now in this culture, but in times past, was a really vital part of of our culture, of family life, of being together. Think about uh, everyone coming together in a stadium and singing our national anthem or other things at a birthday party, for example, happy anniversary. So singing is an expression of joy and indeed in the scriptures, especially the book of Revelation, we have these wonderful images of the choirs of angels singing God's praises. So we manifest our joy as a community by coming together and singing God's praises. Uh, so just on a, on a note, it, oftentimes Father and I will be coming in and we'll be looking at people as we're coming in and we're impressed always by not just those who are singing and singing well, but by those who aren't even making an effort. So if we're going to take advantage of the opportunity to participate fully in the worship of Almighty God, all of us, even those of us who don't have any ability to sing, should be making some effort to participate, picking up the songbook, at least trying to mouth the words or singing softly if you don't have the gift of song. But everyone really needs to be participating and showing that they're just engaged in what's happening as opposed to standing there like this with your hands in your pockets or you know, waiting like this or putting your hands in the pews. So everyone needs to participate. I think just on that note, um, I think we've noticed and if you've gone to an ordination mass or if you've gone to um, a mass in the archdiocese at the cathedral where everybody is there who wants to be there and the singing is just like raising the roof singing and it's just so much more um, powerful and you really feel a part of something something amazing the archbishop after this um, historic procession that we had we sang um, this o salutaris and it was just resounding you know the cathedral with you know seven thousand people in the cathedral singing that that song and and I just, I, I think to your point, is just um, the more people sing, the more we just feel alive, you know, as a community. With regards to what we sing, you know, we, we try to sing music that is of good quality. Uh, God, of course, deserves our very best in everything. We give him the best of what we are. That's why we have a beautiful church and a gold tabernacle and beautiful vessels and beautiful vestments. So our music has to also be reflective of our very best and has to be truly beautiful and lifting our hearts and minds to God. Uh, the way we do it here, uh, and there, the church does give us options, we sing a hymn first as we're walking in because it just takes a certain amount of time to literally get in. And we want people to have the opportunity to participate. So many of our parishioners have said, we want to be able to sing, so we want to honor that and give them the opportunity to sing some of the great hymns of our church tradition. But then we shift gears a little bit. Once we enter the sanctuary, the, 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 uh, the, in a sense, the, the mood changes a little bit. Then we get more solemn as we enter the sanctuary and are more uh, close to the actual beginning of Mass. Then we rely on the church's ancient patrimony, a 1500 year plus tradition of singing chant. So our scola or cantor or choir leads, leads the people and on our behalf and singing some of the beautiful chant melodies from our tradition. Uh, and there's a, a somber, uh, haunting, uh, noble, and holy quality to that ancient music of the church. 
So we want very much to try to honor and protect and preserve our patrimonial chant. So that's why you'll notice a transition as we enter the sanctuary. It's particularly noted at the 10 o'clock mass, the high mass, when we incense the altar, listening to beautiful music that is uh, probably 1500 years old. So there's a reason for doing both the hymn and then the intro as kind of a segue to get more proximally into the preparation for Mass. And I think our music director does a good job of, with hymns in particular, trying to join them to the readings and you know to the season. And also, the, if you want, look at the chant, I've always noticed that it's, it's very much connected to the readings of the Mass. You know, that there is, if you look at that, um, the chants, the entrance um, chant, it's usually a reflective of the readings and sometimes uh, it helps me in my homilies because it, it gets kind of the, the little gem from that kind of brings all the readings together so it, it's a it's something that i think is important not to exclude from the mass because i think it helps us to prepare for what we are going to be hearing what we are going to be experiencing at this that particular mass that we are in and we should also know just to kind of bring to a close our discussion of music and the entrance chant that the entrance chant in particular is an official part of the church's liturgy. It's actually written out in the mass book, the, the Roman Missal that we use. So it is an official part of the liturgy. Hymns are not, but the intro and communion antiphon that we sing are. Uh, and, and although the church gives us options, its highest number one choice is that the uh, entrance music should include the entrance chant, the so-called intro of the mass with chanting. That's the reason why we do it. That moves us on then to actually the movement called the procession as we come into church. So you'll notice that that we start in the back for the Sunday celebration and for major feast days. Uh, we're led by the cross and candles and the lector, an official minister of the church's liturgy, followed by the deacon carrying the book of the gospels, reverencing the word of God, followed by the priest who's who's uh, there celebrating in the person of Christ, the head of the body of the church. So there's an order to the procession as we come in. Why do we begin with the, with the cross? Well, because the cross is the mean by which our salvation was accomplished. He's surrounded by candles because the candles symbolize that Christ is the light of the world, just as we have the Easter candle brought in at the great Easter vigil. Followed then by the lay ministers, then followed by the sacred ministers. The deacon has always been associated with the proclamation of the gospel. It's part of his special charism and ordination, so he carries the book of the gospels. And you'll note as we get to later on that the book of the gospels is placed on the altar, which then connects the notion that the word of God, the scriptures, are intimately associated with what happens on the altar, the word becoming flesh through the consecration of the mass in the sacred liturgy, the liturgy of, of the Eucharist. And so I think too, it's like just, you know, those, you know, what the, what the procession is, but I think it's also, we can look at it in terms of, you know, as we spoke about um, or read about in the last chapter about the mysteries of our faith and, and even tying this into, um, you know, Father Driscoll speaks about, you know, that Christ is entering the church and the priest in the person of Christ, we have the book of the gospels, but also I think we can look at it in terms of you know, that remembering that great procession of Jesus who was entering into Jerusalem uh, to begin that passion tide, you know, where he is going to suffer and he is going to die and he is going to rise from the dead. And, and so all of that can be symbolic of, of Jesus' own entry into Jerusalem, you know, the procession at every Mass. And also, I think, you know, Deacon, you have brought up to me about just how the procession, you know, even for us personally, can be, um, can be significant in that it, it helps us in our journey through life. You know, the church has an ancient tradition stemming back to the Old Testament times. We read that David, King David, led a procession triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem, which became the city of David, with music and singing and tambourines, etc., dancing. And so the procession is supposed to be a sign of our pilgrimage on the way to life to the home of our Heavenly Father. So. Uh, we have other processions in the Mass, the Offertory Procession, which we'll get to uh, next month. We have the Communion Procession. We process in as the people of God, hungering for the bread of life as we go up to receive the Holy Eucharist. So processions are an integral part of our life as Christians and have really an ancient as well as more uh, modern symbolism. 
I was talking to uh, the kids, I did a marathon of uh, talking about the introductory rights to our school kids um, yesterday, and one of the things I brought up is, you in life, we always have a destination. If we're going on a vacation, if we're going somewhere, uh, you wouldn't really want a pilot who didn't know where he was going if you were on a flying somewhere. So the idea being is that in our lives, you know, we are on procession and we have a destination. And in the church here, we are, we're focused, we're going to the altar of God. Um, we are climbing, you know, going towards the tabernacle. Our whole lives, we have a beginning and an end. You know, we have, the church teaches that we all, that there is the, the four last things, you know, death, judgment, heaven, or hell. And our lives here are kind of a witness of processing where are we, where is our destination, what is our goal in this life, and, and our, we should be um, orientating our lives, um, conforming our lives along that, um, that procession that leads um, uh, to the kingdom of God. And so with that, I think we're just going to, we are going to walk forward and, and, and do our procession uh, towards the altar of God. And as we enter the sanctuary, one thing that you'll notice is that the servers will bow because they're carrying things, and that um, whoever carries something will bow, but then uh, those who are not will genuflect, and we are reverencing Jesus Christ present in the tabernacle, but we are also reverencing um, the altar, of which we will talk about in just a minute. the altar and I think sometimes people will wonder well, why do the priest and the de the priests and the deacon kiss the altar and it's a sign of reverence um, in the book that uh, we're reading father Driscoll speaks about the altar he says it's nothing less than the throne of God and um, the throne of the Lamb of God and we read about that in the book of Revelation but the altar symbolizes so much more in that it um, it represents Christ in our midst, that he is that cornerstone. He is the, uh, the rock on which our faith is built. But also the altar is that place where, as we mentioned last time, that, that this is where we gather together in these great sacred mysteries of our faith, the Last Supper, the death of our Lord, the resurrection of our Lord, uh, his ascension. And so... We commemorate all of those sacred mysteries here on this altar, so it is a very sacred space, and why we kiss it in, in, in reverence, um, because of all of these things that happen here. The bread and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ to, to feed his people. And so in this, we, um, the altar is a great um, symbolism. Um, we also have a relic in this altar, too, which many people have asked, and I'm not exactly sure who that uh, relic is. Deacon um, may know that. Uh, but I'm going to uh, have Deacon speak about the altar as well. So we have, you'll notice on the altar, candles, again symbolizing the light of Christ. We process with candles on special feasts, the Feast of the Presentation or Purification, where candles are traditionally blessed, again symbolizing Christ being the light of the world. This is the altar of sacrifice. It's not just a meal table, but it's also at the same time an altar of sacrifice. So we have the symbol of that sacrifice, Christ on the cross. And many of you may not know that in addition to the, alt to the, to the cross you can see, we have an additional cross that only we can see on our altar. This is a special cross. It's actually from the Cathedral of Milan, Italy. This is a famous cross to the people of Milan. Remember St. Charles Borromeo, our patron, was the Cardinal Archbishop of Milan. And we obtained this cross from that same cathedral. This was an ancient cross, a thousand years old. This is obviously a replica from the cathedral in Milan. This was blessed for us by the Cardinal Patriarch of Milan, Italy, Cardinal Tetsamanzi then back in 2008. So this is our personal tie here at St. Charles with our mother church, the Cathedral of Milan, of which our patron St. Charles was the pastor and chief shepherd. In addition, we have the altar cloth, which is uh, symbolic of the burial cloth of Christ, as well as serving as the, the function of the other aspect of the altar being the meal cloth, the tablecloth, if you will. 
with regards to reverence in the altar, an additional thing that we do to show reverence other than our kissing the altar is at the 10 o'clock mass and other special feast days, we incense around the altar. And incense is an ancient symbol from the Old Testament as well as from the book of Revelation in the New Testament. We show our honor for things that are holy by incensing them. So for example, at funerals, we incense the body of the deceased Christian. We incense the book of the Gospels at Mass. We incense the Blessed Sacrament at Mass. So incense is one of those ancient symbols. I note that we also incense the people of God who are a holy people as well. So that's one other sign of reverence that we show. So after we're done at the altar, then we proceed to the chair where we then preside over the sacred mysteries. So here is at the beginning of the introductory rites of and my, the greeting to the people in which we begin as we begin all things in our prayer as Catholics in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this prayer is such a powerful prayer. I think sometimes often people don't think of it as a prayer. Um, I like to point out that, uh, that it can be very powerful for us uh, simply in times of temptation, in times of doubts or struggles that we're having to simply make the sign of the cross. I talked to uh, at uh, the formation night and I said that a sister once observed us seminarians coming in and, and making, um, blessing ourselves and we were doing this and she said, it looks like you're swatting flies. And I said, you know, that kind of has stuck with me um, in the sense and I thought, you know, it's, it is, it is kind of like swatting flies. It's swatting the enemy, you know, these demons that tempt us and cause us to doubt and tempt us to discouragement. And in those times, I think just simply making that sign of the cross, and it also unites us together as a people of God, that we have been baptized in the name of, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And also in the book of Revelation that we hear about, this sign was on the foreheads of all of the people um, who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and that, that this sign is the sign of the cross, the sign of our Lord um, who has conquered the enemy. And so I think, so we begin, we begin with the sign of the cross, as we begin, we begin all things, and then I have the greeting, the Lord be with you. And I greet the people of God, um, not by simply saying, good morning, how are you doing? Uh, but it's, um, the Lord be with you. Or there's other variations of this. Um, uh, the bishop, who has the fullness of orders, um, he says, the peace be with you. And if you remember, those are the words that Jesus himself greeted his apostles with when he, was, he, he um, appeared to them after his resurrection in the upper room or when he appeared to them um, in various places. And so those words, peace be with you, that the bishop says are, are intimately tied to Jesus, um, who desires that his peace be with his people. And, um, and then after that, uh, the people respond, and with your spirit. And so it's a sense of just that interchange that um, I desire Christ, the Lord, to be with uh, the people of God, and, and they desire um, the Holy Spirit and, and God to be with me. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Just a, a couple more things, and I mentioned this in homily a couple weeks ago, but we begin with the sign of the cross because we mark on our own bodies, we inscribe on our own bodies physically the very uh, instrument by which our salvation was won, because our salvation was won by Christ on the cross. But we, we join then, not just the mark of our salvation with Christ, but we unite that with this whole idea of our belief in the Holy Trinity. That's why we say, as we inscribe ourselves in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because we're a Trinitarian people. We're Christians, we follow Christ, but we're a Trinitarian people. We honor and express our belief that God is the Father, that He is the creator of the universe, that He is the source of all being, He is the fullness of being. We recognize that Jesus is our Savior, the second person of the Trinity, the Word who became flesh for our sake. We recognize, honor, and profess our belief in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, whose creative action and power is that which made the universe but is also still present and active in our church and in the world, indeed, in the whole universe today. So it's a very symbolic action that we do. And then just a, another word about the greeting. Uh, we use often the words of St. Paul in a fuller expression of greeting, 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Those are taken directly from the words of St. Paul, either at the beginning of many of his letters or at the end of his greeting. And the significance of the people responding in with your spirit is very profound because it actually refers to the spirit given by the right of ordination to bishops, priests, and deacons. So the Holy Spirit came to dwell in us and mark our souls in a very particular and unique way with the right of ordination, with the reception of holy orders. And so we're not just saying, as Father mentioned, well, peace be with you or the Lord be with you and also with you. It's, it's the recognition that the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in the soul of the ordained because of holy orders. So we see that come up in other parts of the Mass when that dialogue, we see it at the Gospel, when the deacon says the Lord be with you and the people respond and with your spirit. Again, a very particular recognition of the power of the Spirit working through the sacrament of holy orders. And one thing I just comment briefly on that is one thing I liked Father Driscoll said in his book that kind of the people, it, was, it struck me as a priest, like be the priest that you were ordained to be. You know, just, and that was kind of a calling out of, of to, to, um, to recognize your identity and as a priest of Jesus Christ. So now we move on to the penitential rite, and um, this moves into that introduction. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. And this is an opportunity for us uh, to recall our sins. Now, we don't have a long period of time. Uh, to reflect upon, you know, to go through a whole examination of conscience. Um, but it does say a brief pause for silence follows. And so that brief pause can vary um, from person to person, um, from parish to parish. But it's, um, but it's offering us a brief pause at least to say, you know, I am sorry, Lord, or I'm um, to ask forgiveness for our sins. And, you know, it is that opportunity that Jesus even tells us um, that if your brother has sinned against you, go first reconcile with your brother and then bring your gift to the altar. So this idea of, of entering um, into this period of, of asking forgiveness for sin, some people say, well, why do you begin so down? You know, why does the church, why do we start the mass in such a um, kind of a downer type of way? In fact, this is an acknowledgement and great humility of our sinfulness, of our need for a savior. Because Jesus, we first need to recognize how much we need God's mercy and, um, and how much we need to forgive others as well. And so I, if you have any thoughts on the penitential well, this, right. this whole act of, of penance, the penitential right, actually is then the direct result or fruit of having made the sign of the cross and the greeting. Because we recognize the sovereignty of Almighty God and our smallness before God, if we want to be honest enough, and so what must we do once we recognize that? We have to acknowledge our weakness before Almighty God, who is all-powerful and who loves us and who is so merciful with us. So the penitential rite is really the natural extension of that first profession of belief that we expressed in the sign of the cross and in and, the greeting. And in the, um, uh, the confidier that we pray at most Sunday Masses, you know, there's uh, variations of the penitential rite. Uh, if you come to daily Mass, we typically do um, uh, a simple one. Uh, but at Sunday Masses, we do the confidier. And I love that part where it just drives home that point of what you're saying is, is you know, where it gets to that through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. And it tells us at that moment, to, you know, striking their breast, they say, through my fault, through my fault. We live in a world where it's everyone blames everyone else for their sins. Nobody takes, uh, uh, you know, accepts responsibility for their actions and it's this is an opportunity for us to say no it's my fault i sinned i did it i'm wrong and it's great it's a profound humility i think in that and i going into the whole mystery of faith with this penitential right as i mentioned that recognizing our need for a savior and and that leads to um to the next part at mass uh, the gloria that we pray and i like to think oftentimes that you know the people before Jesus Christ, um, they were kind of dead in their sins. You know, they didn't have a savior. You know, they were hoping for a savior, uh, but it was at that moment of the announcement of the savior uh, that the angels appeared to, to the shepherds and they sang glory to God in the highest. 
And I think as we sing that glory, we're echoing the song of the angels that a Savior has come, that we are now forgiven of our sins, that, um, you know, that we can enter into this, this great, profound, sacred mystery of the Holy Mass because Jesus the Savior has come and he has forgiven us our sins. So just like the penitential rite is the natural fruit of expressing our belief in God Almighty, Praising God, then, is the natural fruit of once we acknowledge our sins, we know that God does forgive us. He does have mercy on us. He does love us profoundly. So we must then give him thanks and praise. And that's really what the glory expresses, our thanks, our praise of Almighty God, and our continued plea for his mercy. That all then leads to the final act, if you will, of the introductory rites which is the opening prayer of the Mass, also known as the Collect, C-O-L-L-E-C-T. It's a funny word, and really what it refers to is that there's a period of silence when the priest presiding says, let us pray. Everyone in the congregation, and priest, deacon, and all the people then should be thinking, what am I here to offer in this Mass? What am I here to give to Almighty God? What are my thoughts, my prayers, my aspirations, the problems, the burdens that I carry that I then bring to this Mass? We collect, we recollect in our minds these things, and then through that period of silence, the presiding priest then collects all those personal intentions and offers then a single prayer to Almighty God on everyone's behalf. Hence, it's called the Collect, and he begins that then after let us pray with the words of the prayer. And I think, you know, just finally with that um, collect, when I say let us pray, it's a, a reminder, I think, to all of us why we're here. We're here to pray, you know, and I think oftentimes people come to Mass to be entertained, or they come to Mass, it's like, well, you know, I want, I hope the music's good, or I hope the homily's good. But fundamentally, the Mass is a prayer. It's the greatest of all prayers. And so that reminder of let us pray I mean, or that, that, those words, let us pray, should be a reminder to all of us that that's why we are here, to pray, and to, to enter deeply into this, this prayer, which is the Mass. And then it's after that preparation, the sign of the cross, the greeting, the penitential rite, uh, the glory of giving praise, and finally the summation of all that, all of our aspirations in the opening prayer of the Mass, then we're finally prepared and disposed enough to actually hear God's word in the liturgy of the word which, with the sacred scripture readings that are then proclaimed from the amble, which we'll get to next time. So I hope it's been clear through just this little time that we've spent how important it is to actually be here for the introductory rite. Sometimes we're struck that people come in at the Gloria or at the opening prayer or at the beginning of the scripture First readings. readings. So, yeah, so you know, just like we prepare ourselves for every other major thing that happens in our life, we must prepare ourselves for the great mystery that is the Mass. So hopefully uh, those who have, who have uh, a tendency to maybe come in late will realize I'm missing some really significant parts of the Mass if I don't come in for the opening uh, procession, hymns, and the beginning of the Mass. So hopefully this has been helpful to all of you. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing our work on explaining the meaning of the Mass in the upcoming sessions with you. God bless you all. God bless you.